Hello everybody. In this video, I would like to consider three poems this time, of which two are very short, um, that are sort of loosely um, grouped by uh, the enjoyment of um, pleasure in ways that we, uh, we shall see, but still very much keep up the theme of um, the post-industrial landscape that we have looked at, and also there are references here to things like um, childhood and growing up, and the sort of urban and rural aspects as well. So, before we begin then, a few uh, brief summaries of the poems, Hedge School from page 14, The Equation from page 17, and Swallows from page 18. Well, first of all, Hedge School um, depicts um, a childhood memory of uh, Shears uh, eating the wild blackberries, as the title suggests, from a hedge. Um, the equation uh, is a sort of exploration of a character who is a teacher, but also a sort of countryman in the tension there, and swallows, as the name suggests. Um, it's quite a pretty lyric about, you guessed it, uh, some swallows, but rather nice. One contextual note before we begin, the put in hedge school uh, carries an inscription um, from Chaucer's um, Pardoner's Prologue, which is uh, a part of the, the Canterbury Tales, the sort of long um, sort of proto-novel text um, that he was still working on up to his death uh, in about the year 1400. Um, it's another example of the highly elusive um, style that Shears adopts something known as intertextuality um, and it's this idea of writing which relates to other writing and again partly it's used to sort of create imagery but again it's also I think part of Shears is staking his claim in the pantheon in the tradition of English uh, literature and the quotation interestingly enough is about um, it's about the idea of um, paradise really um, or heaven uh, and it simply describes a character though that her soul has gone a blackberry though her soul has gone a blackberry um, so it's, it's it's a metaphor then simply for um, for a heaven which is associated with these kind of indulgent earthly pleasures um, but of course it's a really lovely image about the beauty of nature as well um, without any further ado, we'll move on. You'll see the reference of the other images that I've picked on here as we look at the poems themselves. So, firstly then, Hedge School. The walk home from school got longer those first weeks of September, listening to the minibus diminish through the hedges and trees, then slipping the straps of my bag over each shoulder to free up both hands for the picking of blackberries. Another lesson, perhaps, this choice of how to take them, one by one, tracing their variety on my tongue from the bitterness of an unripe red, tightly packed as a nervous heart, to the rain-bloated looseness of those older, cobwebbed and dusty as a claret laid down for years in a cellar. Or to hoard them, piling in the palm until I cooked a coiled black pearl necklace, a hedgerow caviar, the bubbles of just poured wine, still in my fingers which I take together, each an eye of one great berry, a sudden symphony. Or as I did just once, strolling towards the low house growing at the lane's end, not to eat them at all, but slowly close my palm into a fist instead, dissolving their mouthfeel over my skin, and emerging from the head and tree tunnel, my knuckles scratched, and my hand blue-black-red, as blooded as a butcher's or a farmer's at lambing, or that of a boy who discovered for the very first time just how dark he runs inside. On the subject of darkness, I do think that this is a poem that does get really very surprisingly dark, for one that starts out as a celebration of pleasure. But we'll talk more about that a little later. Next then, the equation. He told me how, 
after soft afternoons teaching logarithms and waving away the blackboard's hieroglyphics with a damp cloth, he'd return home to the sweet methane of the chicken sheds. How he changed from his suit into overalls, and how he dug his hand deep into the bucket to draw out a leaking fist, which he opened, a sail of grain unfurling to the birds beneath. And how later that same hand would flatten to find a way through the dark under the sleeping weight of a hen, to bring out, like a magician whose tricks are just the way of things, one egg, warm and bald in his brown palm. And finally, swallows. The swallows are italic again, cutting their sky jive between the telephone wires, flying in crossed lines, their annual regeneration so flawless to human eyes that there is no seam between parent and child. Just always the swallows and their script of descenders dipping their ink to sign their signatures across the page of the sky. Let's begin then now with hedge school. So, first of all then, this is a poem that in terms of timing is quite significant because it starts in the first weeks of September. In other words, the end of summer. We have a sense of things coming to an end. And I suppose, therefore, then, the pleasure of the blackberries that come with this time is, in a sense, a kind of symbol of the last clutch of summer. It's a reminder of the abundance of summer that is coming to an end before the winter. And if we take that sort of conceptual metaphor that we get quite often, the idea that the sort of cycle of the seasons represents the cycle of life, then this is somebody who is conscious of conscious about growing older. And straight away then, we can link this poem to things like border country, which con uh, concerns growing up. Um, we can link it to um, uh, father as well for the same sort of reason. Uh, and once again, in, in a sense, the use of the, these sort of journeys through the landscape, again, it's quite a romantic idea, the use of the, the journeys through landscape for these rather philosophical reflections. So, the walk home from school got longer those first weeks of September, listening to the minibus diminish, diminish through the hedges and trees. In other words, the minibus that takes you to a town, to school, to sort of what we think of as modern civilization is going away and he finds himself back in this rather timeless scene of the country lane and the hedgerows filled with these blackberries. And the sort of determination of it, the fact that he slips these straps over the shoulder, you know, the sibilance there again, in order that he can apply himself to this pursuit of pleasure, which, as we've said, is a reminder like the pleasures of our lives that are transient and temporary. Um, to free up both hands for the picking of blackberries. Remember we have this idea of blackberrying as a sort of escape, as a happy pastime, coming from the Chaucer inscription, but also, in the case of the Chaucer inscription, there's that darkness attached to it as well, because in order to reach it, you have the sort of trial through it. And I suppose, metaphorically, it's a similar idea. To pick blackberries, you have to sort of risk um, the thorns, and I, I would argue it's almost impossible to pick blackberries for any length of time without getting scratched. In the same way that you have to pass through that trial to reach the pleasure, similarly, you must pass the trial of death to reach the paradise of heaven. There's quite a nice um, sort of metaphorical equation there. Another lesson, perhaps, and that takes us back to the metaphor of the minibus from school and also to the title itself. Another lesson. It's an entirely different kind of lesson, an older lesson, a lesson that, that um, pitches him in his heritage and the, in the sort of place that he comes from, unlike the more universal depersonalized uh, education that a school represents. 
another lesson, and perhaps this choice of how to take them. And he uses the this image. There's the, 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 of eating them, and the two the, cho the two choices that he has are one to eat them, or two to keep them, to hoard them, which is what these two stanzas here suggest. Um, and I suppose then the two images of either to have your pleasure now or to defer your pleasure can be related again as a metaphor for the idea of growing up because being able to defer pleasure is something that children are, are notoriously bad at be that um, when they are confronted with some mini cheddars or any other uh, particular um, temptation um, and um, but being able to sort of resist that and to hold off is seen as being a kind of sign of um, a, a, of sort of maturity and of adulthood, the ability to know that you'll be able to enjoy something later. Um, so in a way, this then now becomes a poem about the decision, doesn't it? To grow up, to remain childlike. Let's look at how he describes it. First of all, then, one by one, tracing their variety on my tongue. We get a sense then of this a profoundly tactile, a profoundly sensory poem, and the tracing on the tongue, those delicate consonant sounds, I think, um, mimic the sort of sheer pleasure of that experience. And the way that he, uh, picks, he, he pictures it, the bitterness of an unripe red, tightly packed as a nervous heart, that lovely sort of simile, um, to the rain-bloated looseness of those older. And he describes these blackberries with a connoisseur's perception, um, the detail, the profoundness. That these are not simply blackberries to shears, but they have their ca characters and variety. And the imagery that he uses, an unripe red, a claret on the other laid down for years in a cellar. So the metaphor is of wine, a young wine, an old wine. But of course, these are items that are associated with gourmet pleasures, epicurean pleasures, um, pleasures of indulgence. For Shears, then, the joys of the natural world are just as luxurious as these sort of prestigious items like a fine wine. Um, The second stanza in this section, then, rather shorter, which implies the more adult version, the idea of hoarding them, of deferring the pleasure, piling in the palm, he says, and the light plosives there emphasise the stacking up of them until I cooked a coil black pearl necklace. Strange, then, isn't it? Because it, I think he describes it now just as um, elegantly as in the previous one, perhaps even more so, as if in the end, growing up has more of an attraction to him. That lovely image of, again, if you talk about these sort of luxury items, the idea of the black pearl necklace. The pearl necklace, obviously, a lovely imagery, something that's associated with purity, but there's a curious note of um, sort of, well, literally darkness, but metaphorically also that creeps in when it's described as being black. Clearly, on the one hand, he's describing blackberries, and yet the sort of general um, pleasant feeling of this poem is slightly soured here, when I suppose that links back to the beginning when we talked about the whole September thing and the idea of things coming to an end. Um, it's a reminder, I suppose, about the sort of temperiness and the transience of it. But there's another metaphor for luxury sort of thing, the idea of a hedgerow caviar, again, associated with luxury items. The bubbles of a just poured wine links back to the unripe red and the claret, which is another type of red wine uh, from the Bordeaux region um, in France. And um, uh, so he equates it again, but again, it's, um, it's, a, it's a lovely vision, but think about it. Bubbles, just like these fruits, are temporary and transient and he already in the previous stanza describes the fact that this fruit is aging this fruit is starting to decompose um the emphasis is on time passing but he goes on then the bubbles still in my fingers 
So, um, in other words, suggesting that the, the sort of clusters of the fruit look like these bubbles implies then, doesn't it, that picking them is an attempt to halt time, an attempt perhaps not to grow up, not be forced to confront the uh, real adult world. But he says, still do my fingers which I take together, each an eye of one great berry, a sudden symphony. And again, um, we think about these, you know, the idea of a symphony the, in the classical music sort of orchestral piece as being a sort of a symbol of harmony and togetherness, linking back to the lovely images that he's had of uh, this pile of berries and the beauty of it. He's equating the natural world with the finest things that mankind can create. Now, it's interesting that this stanza here is notably shorter. Um, it's, uh, it's only a sanke in a five-line stanza by comparison to the previous ones that were respectively six and seven lines long. Um, a sestet and a septet. Um, it's interesting because there is a sense, isn't there, that the, the adult maturity of keeping them is less attractive, I think, in spite of the beauty that he can admire, is less attractive than the sensual pleasures of scoffing them down at once. Perhaps that's what's reflected there. Now, those two stanzas in the middle seem to offer a straightforward choice. Pleasure now, or pleasure deferred. Childhood, adulthood. But this final stanza again begins with an or, as does the, the third one, demonstrating that actually there is a final choice which is offered. And this is where the poem, which has, as we said, has had these hints of darkness from the start, actually this sort of darkness starts to coalesce here. Because he says, or, as I did just once, strolling towards the low house growing at the lane's end. Notice how the house is personified, or m perhaps metaphorically related to the idea of a plant, as if that too seems like an organic part of the landscape. That too seems to belong here, just as Shears feels that he does. Um, but he says, not to eat them at all, but slowly close my palm into a fist instead, dissolving their mouthfeel over my skin. To crush them then in his hand, hence the mouthfeel over the skin. Experience that sort of sensation, sensual experience in a different way, and emerge from the hedge and tree tunnel, my knuckles scratched and my hand blue black red. In other words, seemingly the mingling of his blood from the thorns and the juice from the blackberries. Um, and suddenly there's this sudden cluster of these very, very, very dark the blue black bloodied butcher um, suddenly the kind of darkness of the poem is emphasized um, with this simile as a bloodied as a butcher or a farmer's at lambing um, this is suddenly not now um, the relatively idyllic image of nature this is an emphasis on the savagery and the brutality of nature. Animals get slaughtered. Um, you know, they, they, they give birth. You know, there's blood and there's mess. In the same way that um, he, uh, we talked about the idea of being scratched and so on before. Um, life is not perfect. And the final line and a half, not quite a full couplet because the last line is really a sort of half line, or that of a boy who's discovered for the very first time just how dark he runs inside. There's something almost psychopathic here, because if your two options are enjoy pleasure or defer pleasure, this third option, the five, that's just to say the fourth stanza, seems to be take pleasure not in enjoying but in destroying 
And I suppose perhaps this too is a part of growing up. This learning your boundaries, this learning what you can and cannot do. Perhaps that's what uh, he's exploring. But notice just once, in other words, there's a sense that he rejects this. He rejects the sort of um, the, this this more sort of disturbing image. Um, but and as, as you know, so clearly this is a part of his character that he might explore but does not embrace. Um, but the ending of the poem, the boy who discovered just how dark he runs inside. On the one hand, it's about literally perhaps the blood and the shock of seeing it. But again, metaphorically, he's learnt about this whole sort of almost cruel side of himself. So it's another poem about growing up. It's another which we can describe as the, the you know the division between childhood and adulthood it's another poem between that sort of stands on the cusp between childhood and adulthood and about the dilemma of it um considering that shears was, was very much an adult at the time of writing um this collection it's interesting how much he seems to be stuck in this dilemma about what it means to grow up once again, it's another poem. The stanzas are rather irre are irregular in length. The lines are irregular in, in length. It's free verse once again. It's all organic. It's all natural. It's almost sort of stream of consciousness. There's the loose ordering in this poem, the loose structuring around these three options and what they metaphorically reveal about him. Um, in the fourth stanza, there's the two half lines, which are the second and third line growing at the lane's end, not to eat them at all, which I think sort of really create these kind of pauses in a sense, because they almost don't quite fit the sort of rhythm. Um, half line pause, half line pause, the pace slows, and I think creates drama for the sort of final slightly shocking image that we get. Let's move on to the equation then. Now, the first thing to note about this is that it is a sonnet. However, it is an extremely uh, irregular one, uh, in the sense that there is no regular rhyme scheme. There is a kind of fairly regular meter. Um, it's sort of loosely iambic pentameter, I think, but other than that, um, it, uh, it only really alludes to it. Now, we've all talked before, um, I'm sure, about what a sonnet is most archetypally associated with, which is the idea of um, sort of perfection of um, these kind of immaculately crafted poems. And of course, the archetypal topic for us on it is about love. However, it's possible to subvert that. Think about Ozymandias, where actually the love that was explored there is not that which is romantic, but which is love of the self. I think here what we're looking at is love for one's surroundings, love for one's um, place in the world. Now, on my previous video on border country, we talked about this idea of um, Shears using the parallel with Raymond Williams, this idea of going home and exploring feelings of belonging and not belonging. Well, I think that is a theme that's very much taken up here. So, it begins then with this focus on a character. It's possible that it may well be Shear's father. It might not be. It doesn't really matter. Certainly, though, it does seem to be somebody who is in this relatively paternal type role. Um, and rather like Ozymandias, in a funny sort of way, it begins with a reported conversation. But instead of it being the traveller from an antique land who, sp who speaks, here is this unnamed adult who begins, he told me how, after soft afternoons, teaching logarithms and waving away. Um, so hence this person is a teacher. Again, very similarly to hedge school, you have that idea of in the countryside, going to school involves travel. Involves travel to a built-up area. Involves, therefore, leaving behind, in a sense, um, the rural world that you come from. If you like, it's almost a, a way of reaching out to modernity. Um, that rather nice image, the waving away the blackboard's hieroglyphics. Well, first of all, that verb phrase, waving away, there's something almost magical 
as if this is the sort of teacher as um, as magician or as showman. Um, and the, the metaphor of the black boar's hieroglyphics, well, obviously there's a very literal sense of the teacher with unintelligible handwriting. We've all met one of those. Um, but there's also a sense of, sort of something kind of mythical and mystical about the knowledge that's involved. But by wiping it away, he is turning his back on this world. Turning his back on this world and the sort of modern civilization and the urban thing, urban world that it represents. And then the fourth line, he'd return home to the sweet methane of the chicken sheds. It's a kind of oxymoron there, or oxymoron there, because of course, chicken sheds, as anybody who's ever walked past one will know, smell absolutely foul. Um, but he clearly, uh, this, the fact that the adjective sweet is used there, um, demonstrates that for him it has far more appeal than the urban world that he's doing. And how, I mean, however magical his teaching might seem, um, it's this earthier world that he wants to return to that is in fact home. Um, and notice this stanza um, ends on this half line, chicken sheds. Again, this emphasizes the irregularity. Typically, uh, you would expect a regular quatrain, but that si sort of single half line with only three syllables. Um, again, it creates a kind of imbalance, a kind of a pause. Um, and it emphasizes, I think, the division between the two parts of this poem, the two parts of his life. Have he changed from his suit into overalls? So once again, you have the juxtaposition between town and country, represented now through the costume, and how he dug his hand deep into the bucket drawer. Notice, again, all these sort of plosives, dug deep, bucket drawer. Um, suddenly now, we are back into the, this feeling of being grounded in the land. But to draw out a leaking fist, which he opened a sail of grain, unfurling to the birds beneath, talking about throwing feed for the chickens. And again, rather similar to the images of the berries in the hand in the previous poem, it's another very tactile, another very vivid, um, vivid image. And by touching for shears, there seems to be something about connection. If you remember at the end of Father, when he talks about himself reaching for a handhold, Again, it's this sense that by touching, he can locate and secure himself in a world that seems perhaps to be moving or unstable. It's a wish to remain rooted to where he is. But the sale of grain, again, it's a metaphor, but it's about the beauty of this. The fact that for all that these chicken shares might smell funny, um, but to him, the smell is sweet. To him, the feeding is something that seems beautiful. The beauty in nature, rather like the blackberries we just experienced. And it carries on, and how later that same hand would flatten to find a way through the dark, under a sleeping weight of a hen, to bring out like a magician whose tricks are just the way of things, so that simile then linked back to the waving away that we talked about on line two. Um, but this idea again that the, the real magic is in nature, is in life which goes on. This chicken which lays an egg, which he again, notice, touches. It's the second time in this poem you've got the fist full of grain, and now you have this egg in his palm. Again, it's the emphasis of touching things. Touching makes things real for shears. But whose tricks are just the way of things, this is the magic of the everyday life. This is the magic of rural life. The tricks are just the way of things, they're not artificial. And we have at the end of this image, this single egg one egg and it is warm it is living it is a view to the future that this is the life that will continue and i suppose that image 
rather equates to the tree that is planted in trees. Um, this idea of something which will grow into the future and which links us <coughs> simultaneously to the past. Warm and bald in his brown palm. A sense of comfort and of safety because of course simultaneously this hand is one that will protect this egg. There's a feeling of safety that she seems to derive from this image. So yes this is a poem that explores urban and rural but I think perhaps if we're talking about the idea of um, childhood and growing up this is a poem that seems to more to embrace the security of childhood itself and so ultimately the love that is explored in the end is for country and for your place in it and for your heritage. Now finally then with a very brief poem Swallows. Um, this I think is probably the most um, uh, explicitly positive and optimistic of, of Shear's landscape poems possibly alongside the equation here. Um, it seems relatively simple I think. The swallows are italic again. Notice it's a, a metaphor of the sort of relating to the kind of typeface, this the, the sloped written style, such as you see obviously on your, um, you know, on your computer. Um, but that idea of them being leaning forward, so it has that association of speed and of drama. Um, it also relates to the images about commerce, for example, that you have in border country. And once again, it's a reminder that this is shears the um, academic writing um, and I suppose even as he's embracing in this poem uh, the beauty of uh, his home there is still an awareness of the still an awareness of the tension between um, it between his new life and his old one and where he feels at home but look at it, he describes it, cutting their sky jive. So the metaphor then of their flight as dancing, something which is pleasurable, which is escapist. And of course the light uh, consonant sounds here, italic cutting, emphasise the delicacy of their flight. Um, then I think there's another allusion actually here to a uh, Ted Hughes poem. Um, it's one in which he talks about the swallows of summer. Um, one of his less well-known ones actually now but um again once again it's another example i think of shears who is um flaunting his place in the literary heritage um and um but their sky jive between the telephone wires flying in crossed lines now this is shears the post industrial poet because this symbol of nature is juxtaposed against the telephone lines that I suppose represent the intrusion of modern life and also the connection of the country to the city. It's harder and harder, I think, perhaps he is saying, to separate out the two because even here he seems to be joined up to it by these wires. It's a symbol of his connectivity. The flying and crossed lines, again, simply leak back to sky jive, but the idea of the beauty that we see is one very neat uh, end-stopped quatrain. Um, the second one then begins, their annual regeneration, so flawless to human eyes that there is no scene between parent and child. Now, there's a few things here. Talking about their regeneration, as in the way that old birds are replaced with new ones, this therefore links back to the image of the egg on the poem Equation. Um, it links to, again, once again, to trees for a similar reason. Um, and it's this idea about the fact that we are simply at one point in a cycle which has lasted for millennia and uh, will last for millennia more. Um, you can't even see it going on 
um, around you. It's so much a part of the world. Now, when he describes no scene between parent and child, he's describing the smoothness of this continuum. But if we also take that image to relate to the um, period of growing up, then we can also suggest that um, rather unlike in border country, where growing up was presented as being this dramatic shock, here it's seen as something that is painless and inevitable. And perhaps in contrast to the shocking feelings that uh, she has expressed in that poem, perhaps therefore he aspires in a sense for life to be as simple and as elegant and growing up to be as easy as it seems to be for these um, swallows. A further interpretation of the idea of the parent and child thing is the fact that um, we talked in, uh, in, for example, in the poem Father, um, and to some extent also in the poem Inheritance, about that there seeming to be a very slight distance between Shears and his father. And again, therefore, perhaps this is also a wish for something which is closer, a relationship which is closer. Um, and again, it's another end stopped quatrain. Just always the swallows and their script of descenders dipping their ink to sign their signatures across the pages of the sky. Well, what can we take from that? Well, first of all, the fact that metaphorically their looping graceful flight is described as looking like a signature is again a reflection of the sky jive metaphor that we talked about earlier. But also, it's a signal of belonging and possession. These swallows belong there. They are in their element. The sky is their element. And again, I think this is Owen Shears projecting the way that he would like to be. He would like to feel as at home as they do, to feel like he was signed across his habitat, as it were. There's another instance of the um, metaphor, the extended metaphor around the idea of writing, we talked about things being italic, um, talked about lines. Descenders is the name given to those parts, that part of letters which go below the line on the page. So for example, the tail of a Y or a P or a G or a Q, that's what the, the, the bits that point down, that's what we call descenders. So again, it builds on that image. Um, but again, it's very elegant, it's very beautiful. Um, and yet, even in this description, it's a, a reminder that Shears is now an outsider. Because he's not experiencing these swallows um, in a kind of natural and organic way. He's not describing them like a countryman. He's describing them like an educated man. He's describing them like a, um, a, a lecturer in English literature. Um, and so it's strange because even though he admires them, the language here reveals his distance. He will never feel as at home in this land as they do. And so in that sense, for a poem that seems so very happy, there's this subconscious note of sadness, of distance, that it's not something that he'll ever be able to share. He obviously likes the image of birds representing freedom. You have it, for example, in the buzzards in, um, uh, in border country that we mentioned before. But, it get, but, but just as with there, there's a sense that um, he realises that he can never be like that. It's a freedom that he will never share. Um, so this poem, these three simple um Quatrains. It's a deceptively simple poem, I would argue, um, but as I hope you've, you've seen, there is that, uh, once again, that slight um, sadder undertone that goes with it. Uh, on that note, we'll call uh, it an end for this poem, uh, for this video, and uh, we'll pick it up again later. Thank you.